Hey everyone, so this is going to be the last part uh, of this topic of rotations, all about angular momentum. Uh, so we've hit everything so far, we've hit kinematics, we've hit forces, we've hit energy, and this will be the last thing to talk about. Uh, this actually has a very important aspect that we need to discuss. Uh, unlike the other videos though, I'm not going to be splitting this up, so this one might be a little bit longer, just because there's really no logical place to stop. So I'll just jump straight into it. What is angular momentum? Uh, well, it's momentum just for objects that are rotating, easy enough. Uh, the equation that we have for, uh, sorry, the uh, symbol that we have for angular momentum is the letter L. Now, once again, uh, like always, we want to look at the uh, linear case. Linearly, we had this equation for momentum, which was uh, momentum equals mass times velocity. In the rotational version, we replaced mass with inertia, uh, uh, rotational inertia, and velocity with angular velocity to get L equals I omega, right? Since the parallels. And that, that's pretty much it. Um, obviously, there, there are actually a few really big things that you need to talk about. So the first one is that uh, just like with regular momentum, uh, we said this before that momentum in the absence of an outside force uh, was always conserved. That if we had two things colliding and there was no friction on the system essentially, no physical things stopping it from moving, no outside forces, then the objects would transfer momentum between each other in a way so that uh, momentum was always uh, conserved. Well, the same thing applies here, except we just replaced the word force with torque, because again, we're in the angular case now. So in the presence, uh, in the absence of an outside torque, uh, we'll always have a rotational moment, uh, angular momentum conserved. Uh, this basically means like there's no friction acting some distance away from the pivot. Like, uh, for example, pulleys. Pulleys actually do have uh, an outside torque affecting them. Uh, around their um, wheel axle. So uh, just wanted to point that out that, you know, we have the same s typical rules that we have uh, with regular momentum, except we replace the word force with torque. Now, this is actually a really big thing when it comes to multiple choice uh, questions. Uh, it's the main reason that planets travel faster when they get closer uh, to the uh, than they are to the sun. So, for example, uh, we know this uh, when we talked about in the... Uh, it was the universal gravitational section where we talked about how planets, when they're really far away, travel really slow. And then as they come closer, they speed up. There was actually one of Kepler's laws that um, planets sweep equal areas over equal amounts of time. Uh, for the most part, we did try to relate this to the concept of energy and saying that, well, energy is being conserved when it's far away. It has gravitational potential as it comes closer. Uh, it turns that gravitational into kinetic and while that is still true it turns out that the best explanation is this idea of uh, angular momentum because when the planet is rotating around the sun there is a force pointing from the uh, from the planet towards the sun at all times that's the only force acting on the planets as they orbit around well just so happens that that direction that force pointed towards uh, the sun if we actually think of it as uh, a beam essentially connecting the two planets as it orbits uh, the sun is being located at the pivot point so that force pull uh, basically pulling the planets towards the pivot point is essentially a force that's producing zero torque because it's parallel to the pivot uh, it's parallel to the uh, the axis, essentially. So uh, the gravitational force acting on the planets as they orbit around are producing zero torque on the system. Therefore, angular momentum has to be conserved. Now, if you had a multiple choice question, how do you know which one's the correct answer? Like I said, while conservation energy is sort of true, angular momentum is always true. That's something that you know is definitely a uh, lockstep type of uh, statement. Now, the reason that you would give this angular momentum hierarchy is mainly because the way they kind of set up the questions is a little bit dirty. Uh, I've said this before that the questions are designed to trick you. And in particular, a common way that they set up the questions is by either uh, 
giving you a partially true statement, but then having a, a, uh, a fake or false statement thrown in there, meaning that the whole choice has to be, is wrong, or they'll give you multiple, uh, choices that are that, uh, sorry, uh, multiple parts of the sentence being true, but not true related to each other, you know, where it's not really making sense. Uh, so when they set these uh, multiple choice questions up and they, these choices, the angular momentum choice is pretty much nine times out of 10 written properly. It's written with as the choice and with its proper explanation that there's no torque because the force is always pointing towards the, the pivot essentially. Uh, but unlike that, the conservation energy one, they tend to throw in false statements in there. They'll say, they, they'll say energy is being conserved because there is no forces acting on the planet or something like that. So they'll throw essentially like a virus into that statement to make it wrong. So if you see a question about why are planets traveling faster or slower, where they are, and one of the choices says conservation of angular, moment, uh, angular momentum, circle that immediately. You barely have to read the choices, uh, read the rest. You know, that's pretty much it. Check to see if there's any other angular momentum choices, though, because you never know. They might have, you know, one that says there's no outside torque and another one that just says because the speed's constant or something. You know, again, you know, throwing in some false statement in there. So uh, that's basically the big thing. Now, one one of the things that you want to try to constantly think about because the angular momentum questions are very conceptual even though we're going to try to look at some calculation based questions uh, these questions really do hinge on the concepts and being able to visualize this is really going to be very helpful for you the best way to imagine angular momentum is to remember and think about ice skaters uh, ice skaters if you've ever seen them uh, or just any sort of dancer uh, whenever they are spinning, they typically start with their hands outward uh, because that gives them a fairly large rotational inertia. You know, their mass is a little bit spread out from their center of uh, rotation. Uh, but then when they want to start tr uh, spinning faster, they'll bring their arms in. And as they bring them, them in, they'll start to spin faster and faster. And the, the, basically the tighter they can get their entire body, the faster they'll end up spinning. So they will they can actually go to double, maybe even triple whatever their rotational speed was initially. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on here. That's the concepts that you have to remember, that when the rotational inertia decreases, the uh, angular speed increases. There's that inverse relationship, and because angular momentum has to be conserved, when one goes up, the other one goes down. Same thing with the linear momentum, where we've talked about that before, that as the mass of the system goes up, the velocity goes down and vice versa. Same thing here, though you do want to try to uh, visualize the, the ice skater. Now, just like with uh, regular momentum, we had, the, we had those cases where two objects collided together and we had to figure out what the new speed was of something. And basically we did that whole thing where we said, the momentum before equals the momentum after. We talked about how many, uh, we had two objects before, two objects after. Uh, we're gonna do the same thing here. You know, we say that the angular momentum before equals angular momentum after, just like last time where we have two objects before, we have two objects after. Uh, and we're also gonna follow up with one line, one more line where we say that, uh, where we replace the angular momentums with I omega. That's, that's all this is saying. It's saying that we have a momentum of one object, a momentum of another object before the collision, and then we have the two momentums after the collision, and that the sum of them should be equal. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat. See, unlike the other cases where it was uh, linear, you know, we didn't have to really do much with it. It was just, you know, write this, and then we can start putting stuff in. Uh, but unlike this, there are going to be some cases where they'll have a, an object that's interacting with something uh, that's rotating that's uh, and that uh, object actually ends up moving linearly. So perfect example, there's a few of them. Uh, the most common would be uh, a person either getting onto or getting off of a merry-go-round. So uh, the merry-go-round rotates, so it's got angular momentum. But when the person jumps off or jumps onto the merry-go-round, uh, that person ends up traveling in a straight line. 
So they're going to end up having linear momentum. So we're going to have to figure out a way of relating these two together in the same equation. Likewise, when the person's on the merry-go-round, they're a, a, an object. Uh, we haven't really talked about objects moving in circle and what their angular, mo uh, their rotational inertia would be, because we need that if the person is is rotating with the merry-go-round. Uh, but some other uh, common scenarios that you know you've experienced, but we may not cover in these types of uh, problems, would be something like a person swinging a bat and hitting a baseball. Uh, in that case, you have the bat swinging and arcing, rotating along a hinge point, which is at the very edge of the bat. Uh, and when it hits into the ball, that ball is going to move in a straight line. Well, that's a case of a angular momentum setup hitting into an object and transferring that angular momentum into the ball in the form of linear momentum. So uh, how do we end up doing this? Well, the first step is to cover what is the rotational inertia of a particle. So when we have a person or uh, any sort of object that is uh, quote unquote moving in a, uh, moving in a circle, uh, we can replace their uh, rotational inertia with mR squared. Now it is important to note that even if the object moves in a straight line, we could still make this claim because the math is focusing only at the very moment right before to the very moment right after they collide. And in that moment, there really is no difference between moving in a straight line and moving in a circle. A uh, perfect example is the Earth. The Earth is a giant circle, but from our perspective, because we are at such a close proximity to it, it looks straight. It looks flat. Same idea here. You know, from, you know, when you're so, uh, looking at such a short time frame, uh, there is no difference between moving in a straight line or moving in a circle. It's the same. It's later on that one of the objects moves in a straight line, but that's only because there's no centripetal force acting on it. So what we can then say is this, that the uh, angular momentum of the particle is equal to mvr. Uh, where does this come from? Well, we said before that the angular momentum is i omega we know that i is mr squared for the particle. Now, from our conversions, I know that omega times r can be rewritten as mv. Sorry, uh, omega r can be re rewritten as, r, uh, as v. So that gets me mvr as my answer. Or, what I can also say is essentially that, so this is like a way of converting angular momentum to linear momentum, but usually this is only done for single objects. Like, like I said, a person when they're jumping onto or off of a merry-go-round or a ball being hit by a bat or a, or a foot or something. Um, so basically what I'm trying to get at is if the object starts moving in a straight line, instead of using I omega, we're going to replace the I omega with MVR. Uh, if the object is moving in a circle, like for example, a person sitting on the merry-go-round and watching the merry and you know sitting with it as it spins, then we'll just replace the I with MR squared and keep the omega the same. Uh, so again, just like last time with the energy, you know we have two different scenarios where we might change oh where we might change the uh, angular momentum with one thing versus another based off the scenario. Uh, I just want to point out though that just like at always uh, try to work through these problems imagining that this was a linear case and then start seeing how you would do it for the angular case. All right, so here's the first question pause video works up and we'll go over in a second. All right so for uh, this question first thing we want to do is get rid of the dumb choices conservation of kinetic energy and conservation of velocity are not conservation laws. So they make zero sense. Uh, so with the remaining two, the only one that makes sense is C, conservation angular momentum. Now you'll notice, I said before that a lot of times they'll have conservation energy and conservation of angular momentum as choices. However, you'll notice that there is no uh, conservation of regular energy, of total energy. Uh, that's because these questions, uh, these choices don't have uh, the logical explanation behind it. 
So if it's just asking, you know, which one is it? And there's no nothing else besides just the statement. They're not going to put conservation of energy because again, technically you could still use it. It's only the follow through where they have the explanation of why conservation of angular momentum, why it's conservation of energy, uh, where the energy will always have some sort of fake statement in, in there. So it, it's weird, but when you see a few of the questions, it'll start to make a little bit of sense. All right, so here's the next one. Pause the video where itself, and we'll go over in a second. All right, so part A. Uh, by what factors does the angular momentum change? Well, we know that the rotational inertia is uh, decreasing by a factor of two, so it's being halved essentially. Uh, but we know that conservation of uh, angular momentum is true, therefore there is no change in the angular momentum. Easy enough. Uh, so we could actually move on to part B, where it says what's the factor that it changes by? So we're going to use our angular momentum equation, which is L equals I omega, and we're going to do the 1-1 one, one method. Uh, the angular momentum doesn't change, so that's just a 1. The rotational inertia is uh, decreased by a factor of 2. It's halved, so I put a half in there. Solve this for omega, and I get that it increases by a factor of 2, or it doubles. Uh, again, if you don't like the 1-1 one, one method, feel free to just make up numbers, and then you know, if you've said that the rotational inertia initially was 2, then now it's going to be uh, 1. And then you'll just have to compare the two later. All right, uh, so part C, it says, what factors the rotational kinetic energy change by? Now, if you're using the 1-1 one, one method, you'll have to be very careful. Because when you do the equation, remember, there's this 1 half in there. But the statement in, uh, in the 1-1 the one, one method is to always say, uh, does this term change or does it not? And if it doesn't change, replay, uh, keep it as a 1, uh, or change it to a 1, I should say. And that statement holds true even for coefficients. So the 1 half is a 1. So we end up dropping the 1 half. Uh, I gets halved. Angular speed is doubled. Therefore, the uh, rotational kin uh, kinetic energy also doubles it increases by a factor of two. Now, had you left in the one half, you would have gotten uh, basically one that it was unchanged. Uh, the best thing is that if you keep dropping this one half, uh, I would do a before calculation and then an after calculation where I do one half times two squared and you get one. And then what you do is compare these two numbers. Well, initially, when everything was a one, uh, I got a half. But when I plugged in the half and the two for i and omega, respectively, I got one. Going from half to one is a factor, is a doubling effect. It's increasing my factor two. So that could also help you if you're constantly forgetting to drop the, the uh, coefficients. All right, here's the next one. Pause the video, work itself, and we'll go over in a second. So uh, now we're actually getting into the calculations. So they want us to actually figure out the ratio of the final angular velocity to the initial. Let's not worry about that yet. And let's start just doing the math. So uh, we're going to start with conservation of uh, angular momentum. So we have the merry-go-round and the child, initially and finally. Then we're going to plug in the equation. Uh, I omega. Now at the very end, because the child is going onto the merry-go-round and will start to rotate with the merry-go-round, just like with the linear sticking questions, I'm going to say that their final angular speed is the same and I'm going to pull it out. So I end up having this. I'm going to replace the rotational inertias with one half mr squared uh, for the merry-go-round and just mr squared for the child. Uh, notice I'm not replacing this with the mvr like I did last time. Uh, I drop all the r squares because they're all the same and multiply 2 all the way through. And then from here, my ratio is just uh, dividing, the, uh, dividing things over until I get this. And that's it. Here's, uh, so here's the next one. Pause the video where itself and we'll go over it in a second. All right, so once again, we could see that the first part where it says, how does the angular momentum system change? Well, there is no change. Again, the child's moving on the merry-go-round but it's still, he's still part of the system. There's no outside torque, therefore there's, there can't be a change in the angular momentum. So for part B, finding the angular speed of the system, 
right, uh, well, how does the angular uh, speed of the system change? Well, again, as the child comes closer towards the center, we know its rotational inertia decreases because the radius is decreasing, how far away the kid is from the center of uh, the rotation, the pivot point. So since the rotational inertia of the system decreases and the angular momentum has to stay the same, we note that the angular velocity has to then increase. Uh, you could see this in the calculations. Again, uh, it's that sticking scenario. You know, we have L before equals L after. Essentially, we have I merry-go-round plus I child omega naught equals I merry-go-round plus I child omega. And since I of the child is going to decrease, the omega has to increase in order to keep uh, the two sides equal. All right. So let's get some calculations in. Pause the video works off, and we'll go over in a second. All right. Uh, so uh, we have the case where the child's on the merry-go-round, but the, both of them are uh, motionless. So when I set up my equation, I'm going to actually say it's going to equal to zero because initially both the merry-go-round and the child had no angular momentum. So what this tells me is that I can set the angular momentum of the child equal to the angular momentum of the merry-go-round. Uh, the merry-go-round's easy enough. We can replace that with one half mr squared. But for the child, since I know that he's going to end up moving in a straight line, he's jumping off of the merry-go-round, it's not useful for me to leave omega for the child because, well, he's not going to be moving in a, in a curved line. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, replace that with MVR. Uh, with this, I can then simplify. There's an R on both sides, and these R's are the same. Uh, I should point out that you have to remember that the R terms mean different things for these two uh, equations. The R in the rotational inertia is referring to the physical dimensions of the, uh, the merry-go-round. No matter what you do, no matter the scenario, the R doesn't change. But the R for the child is referring to where the child is located. So if the, uh, in this case, the child was at the edge when he jumps off. But if he, uh, so like the R's would be the same. But if the child was located somewhere else, maybe halfway between the center and the edge, uh, then the R would actually be something less, like half, what, half of R. So just keep that in mind that, you know, you want to be careful that the R's do mean something different. Uh, the R for rotational inertia, I think, is the only one that's actually the considered like the constant R that doesn't really change. But all the other R's, like in torque, in the conversion equations, in, this, in the MVR, uh, those are all essentially uh, location-specific uh, for the most part. All right. So with that being said, uh, just simplify. I moved the half over because it's just a, a habit of mine. So we end up with this. And then all, all we do here is plug and chug. Uh, we plug on our numbers and we get that the merry ground is going to start to rotate at 0.9 radians per second. Uh, and if we wanted a direction, we would know it's in the other, like, opposite way. Uh, unfortunately, there's not enough information to figure out w whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise, so we'll just leave it at that. All right. Now, there's one last thing to remember. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about momentum. Uh, if you recall in the linear uh, momentum topic, uh, there was something else that we also discussed, which was called impulse. Well, it turns out that we also have impulse in this angular momentum case, though it's not really called impulse, uh, but it's just more of like knowing a relationship. If you recall, impulse was uh, F net, the uh, net force times the time is equal to M delta V, or uh, let me write it here. Oh, got rid of the pen. F net T equals the impulse, which was just the what we call the change in momentum, m delta v. So same thing here. Uh, again, we replace them with their angular terms. So we end up having this equation tau net t equals delta l equals i delta omega. Uh, just like with the impulse equation, this is just a variation of you know Newton's law. So if you remember, if I move the t over to the other side, 
I just I end up with F net equals MA. Same thing here. If I move the T over to the other side, I'm left with tau net equals I alpha, which is just a variation on Newton's uh, second law. All right. So we'll do this quick. Pause the video with itself, and we'll go for a second. All right, so just like I said before, uh, this is just a variation on, on the torque net equation, which means you don't technically need to use this in order to answer the problem. It's just that uh, instead of doing it in two or so steps, uh, you do it in one single step if you remember this variation of, of uh, impulse. So we set tau net equal to I, I uh, delta omega, uh, though we're going to replace the... Um, the tau with fr. So we have frt equals i delta omega. Plug the numbers in and we get our answer as 0 .0, uh, 0 0.083 meters or 8.3 centimeters. And that's pretty much it. Uh, like I said, I know this video is a little bit long, uh, might have been a little bit longer, uh, but angular momentum is one of those topics that is both important, but at the same uh, point where they are very uh, consistent with the types of questions they ask. A lot of very conceptual questions of understanding the relationship between rotational inertia and the uh, angular speed. Uh, a lot of some calculation questions like what you saw before with the merry-go-round jumping on and off the merry-go-round. Uh, things like that. So you just want to really keep an eye out for them um, and uh, constantly reflect and think of it in terms of the linear momentum questions. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, good luck and have a great day.